Welcome to Occupy Live from Occupy Boston TV. On this show, we want to bring news and stories from both inside and outside our movement. We are your hosts, Laura Blois and Helene Thayer. We are speaking to Grace Ross, former candidate for governor in 2006 and 2010, and for 20 years an activist on issues of housing and economic justice. It's so nice to have you here with us, Grace. Thanks. Now, in addition to all of that, you also work for the Massachusetts Alliance Against Predatory Lending Practices. Can yep. you tell us a little bit about your work with them? Uh, the Mass Alliance Against Predatory Lending, which we call MAPLE for convenience and short, um, started in 2007 when a number of us realized among uh, working class folks we knew that we were seeing a lot more foreclosures and we learned a lot about what was going on we kind of knew having seen where the strings of the financing went that it was going to pull down the whole world economy but at the time couldn't get anybody to see that that was coming um, and so we work on all different fronts. As somebody once said, you know, as long as we get at the banks from every single direction, eventually we're going to win. So we do grassroots organizing. We do um, legal. We have lawyers who are working on trying to move things through the courts. We've passed solid policy stuff at the state level. We've got some municipal ordinances we've been working on, um, as well as just organizing people to try and take back their homes. Uh, could you tell us some, a little bit about some of the ordinances and things you've done uh, legislatively that you think will help? Well, we actually filed legislation uh, in our first real year of existence in 2008 at the state level and, pa and put in some really good proposals. It was late in the session, so those didn't pass, but eventually we got uh, a key groundbreaking piece of legislation passed summer of 2010, which made it so that in Massachusetts, um, if you're a former tenant post foreclosure, they cannot evict you. They have to let you stay and pay rent until the property is bought by a new individual. The banks hold it often for years and it allows people to stay. Um, we've been tracking some improving legislation at the municipal level and the big win was this uh, fall in Springfield. We got two ordinances, a vacant and foreclosing properties ordinance that makes the banks keep up sanitary code when they take over properties, but more importantly because our cities and towns have been paying for their negligence, um, it requires the banks to put down a $10,000 cash bond when they start foreclosing on a property so that when they ignore the responsibilities to the city and to their neighbors, the city has money to pay for the repairs. So I'd really like to ask you about <laughs> some of the experiences. You, you've had experiences with a lot of people who had eviction notices and foreclosures. Right. Can you tell us any personal uh, stories about that? Well, <laughs> I'm going to have my own story in the foreclosure crisis because I moved into a property in, in Worcester that got taken over by a guy who used the subprime mortgages to flip properties. He would buy, you know, several unit properties, cut them into condos, create sta straw men to own those condos and then get them refinanced with subprime mortgages. We figured in the first year he had pulled out $4 million in profits just by flipping properties. And uh, he didn't care about the tenants, he didn't care about the property, he walked away. And so uh, I ended up actually evicted and losing most of my stuff. So the thing in Massachusetts that a lot of people don't know that's the most critical piece of information is that when a foreclosure happens, the ownership of the property is lost to the bank, but you retain your right to be in the property, what's called possession, remains with the people who live there. So it's critically important unlike other states in the country, that people in Massachusetts don't leave. Just because a foreclosure happens, that's only part of your rights that, it, that the banks now own the property, but they become the landlord by law in Massachusetts. They have to let keep the place up to code. They have to let you rent if you're a tenant, and if you're a former homeowner, we encourage people to fight with them to take rent and to stay and to actually be able you know, to continue to live where you are. We're beginning to win that second battle more and more as we go along, and what What's critically important is if people walk away from the properties, then when the banks, who've often foreclosed illegally, they get an empty property, they do what they want with it, and most people don't realize that you have a right to stay until they evict you through court. And if you're there, it's easier for us to fight to overturn the foreclosure. That's important. That's Thank critical. you. So on your website, you also talk about some of the legal irregularities that Massachusetts has that make it difficult for foreclosure victims to contest evictions. What steps have other states taken? That 
Well, so it's evictions, we actually have a lot of protections in Massachusetts because there have been good tenants organizing for literally decades. The thing that's bad in Massachusetts that you're referring to is that homeowners in Massachusetts don't get a day in court before a foreclosure. So in other states, they're called judicial states. They actually have to go through the courts to get their, their uh, sort of execution to move forward with a foreclosure. In Massachusetts, you don't get a day in court unless you initiate a uh, lawsuit. And it's, uh, we're actually putting materials together. Anybody who's listening, who's interested in fighting to save their home or get their home back, we're actually putting materials together for folks to be able to proactively go into superior court, which is one of the least sort of friendly to pro se to people who are representing themselves. But we're actually putting materials together. Those are going to be up on our website. Um, should I give the website? Yeah. It's yeah. www.maapl.info. So maapl.info. Those materials are going to be up there in the next few months so that people can actually take, go through their, all their paperwork, figure out what the banks did wrong. There are about 27 common violations. There are a lot more, but those are the most common ones. Um, and the materials will be there for people to actually take the banks to court themselves. But right now, you don't get a day in court unless you know to initiate it. And so it's a real problem. And we've tried to change that. <clears throat> to move to uh, judicial foreclosure, as it's called, in Massachusetts. In the meantime, if we can get mandatory mediation, which would force the banks to provide an authorized representative to show up with a third-party neutral mediator, they have to show up with all their paperwork, which will actually reveal any, quote, irregularities, illegalities, really, mm -hmm. in what they've done to foreclose. So it'll give people a lot of light of day, and it gives them their opportunity to actually have somebody from the bank who can do something, because usually you call and you get these, you know, and it's like calling through a phone book of people. It's tons of different people, and none of them can really, they all claim they don't have the power to do anything. Mm -hmm. So this would be a good process. We filed this legislation at the state level, and it's one of the ordinances we just got through Springfield. Springfield's going to put their own system in place, and we're hoping cities and towns across the state pick that up, and we move towards having mandatory mediation for everybody. Um, today, of course, we're focusing on homelessness and evictions, yeah. but... Uh, as, as you know, that's clearly related to jobs. And right now the mantra is jobs, jobs, jobs. So what I'd like to know is, uh, do you have a different perspective from the one that we're getting from Washington, D.C. right now on jobs and how to deal well, with that? Well, they're, they're directly connected is the problem. So in, in when they foreclose, what happens, or even if they don't foreclose, the property values have dropped. So people don't have the expendable income they had. What that's done is it literally in Massachusetts, as an example, on our worst months, the people of Massachusetts lose $4.1 billion in spending power. The um, people of our country are actually 70% of the economic activity. We always think of it as business and government that are mostly economic activity, but isn't. It's us. So with all of this loss of money from our pockets, you know, streaming upward to the very wealthy and the big banks, um, we've actually undermined the entire economy. So we're not going to get to jobs if we don't fix this problem. This is the wealth drain upward. That's still going on because of the foreclosures. And so long as that wealth drain is going upwards, wealthy folks, there's great studies that show you can tax the very wealthy, and because they pay their taxes out of their savings, not out of their spending like we do, you can tax them a lot more and improve the economic flow by bringing that money back into the economy. But how do you see actually uh, the best way to go about creating jobs? For example, so there are two. There, okay. are two. there are two ways to create jobs. One is by supporting small businesses. Our economy has moved over to huge these huge chain stores and conglomerates, and what that means is that we're actually taking money out of the sectors that create new jobs. It's your local hardware store, your local, you know, clothing store, etc. That's where the jobs get created. So because our economy has moved away from local jobs and local businesses. I always say to people, you want jobs, spend your money locally. Stop going to the chains, stop going to the Walmarts, whatever. Spend your money locally. The other way, and it's true in every bad economic time, is the government has to spend money that creates jobs. Instead, they keep cutting back on jobs. They, they call it cutting services, but what it's really doing is cutting jobs as well. And the funny thing is, you know yeah. who had a, a government jobs policy? Bush. The only jobs that were created in the upturn under 
uh, Bush Jr. were all government jobs. He had a government jobs program. That's the only place he created jobs during his administration. So when we hear this sort of, oh, it's left, right, whatever, it's a lie. Any president who's smart knows that in a bad economy, you can only create jobs through government jobs. And by shifting the, the tax burden you know, onto the big companies and the wealthy and off of our small businesses and regular people. So you do not agree that uh, jobs in the public sector are not real jobs. No, in That's fact, what's true is that my point is that if you look at the economic policies instead of the rhetoric, Bush knew that. Everybody knows it who's paying attention to the economics instead of the rhetoric. Thank you. Um, I know you're, you're an activist who's been fighting for many social and economic justice issues, and that's much like the Occupy movement. Um, oh, yeah, what, very similar. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see as the underlying fundamental problem that needs to be rectified in order to bring our economy back to life? Well, I think it's the overall trend. I mean, I look at it in the foreclosure uh, segment, but you could look at it anywhere. Um, I wrote a book recently called Main Street Smarts that was about our smarts because we actually do know what's going on. We don't believe in our own awareness of what's going on, but we're right. The pundits are wrong when they argue over right, left, and this, that, and the other thing. We know that it's about regular people not having money. So. Um, the fundamental thing that has to stop is that we've sort of gotten to this place where our government even uses our money to put it into the private sector huge corporations. So you can look in any sector. We should have municipal utilities that run our, our utilities instead of National Grid and NSTAR, these big companies that take the money out of our communities and put them, I don't know, Cayman Islands, wherever. Um, you can look at it in healthcare. We need a single payer healthcare system that would serve everybody where we have one set of rules that apply to everybody. If we don't like them, we change the government policies that create our, me our medical system. But one system, instead of again, siphoning off those profits to big insurance companies. Um, you can look at it in terms of energy, right? We need to weatherize our homes so that we're saving money ourselves and we aren't polluting the environment to, to pay for the electricity to heat our homes, right? Instead, we're, our policies, the big energy initiative is to redo the heavy wires to transfer electricity from polluting plants, from fracking, from whatever those systems are, um, instead of understanding that this is about local wind power solar panels, weatherizing our homes. The system's all the same, and that's where the answer lies. We have to stop putting our money into faraway big companies and start using it locally for local jobs, local energy, local health care, whatever. So do you, do you see this flood of money flowing into uh, our, our elections and public policy to be part of what hinders us in getting moving Oh, well, of course. Forward. It's how we got into this mess. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Laura before the show, you know, in terms of all of the foreclosure mess. It had to do with regulating agencies no longer enforcing the, the regulations and, and loosening of, gov of banking policy that was put in place right after the Great Depression. That was basically dismantled at the end of, of the last century, 1998, 1999. Why did it happen? Because the banks used all their money for lobbyists to get in there and lobby uh, you know, for what they wanted. We were all not even aware that our entire, all the protections in our financial industry were being removed um, or looked the other way. And it had to do with the lobbyists. You, know, you listen to the rhetoric in the you know, halls of government inside the Beltway in D.C., it's not what you and I would be talking about. We're talking about food prices going up because, you know, gas prices have gone up and the transferring of food is taking, costing more money. They're talking about, oh, well, we don't want to make, you know, Bear Stearns go under, and so <laughs> we need to, you know, give them Bloomington News just did a Freedom of Information Act with the Federal Reserve, and they had to admit they had given seven point seven 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 trillion dollars to the banks not the tarp money we heard about but the real thing was the federal reserve which is all run by bankers deciding to loan money to bankers and that's why we don't have money for small businesses we don't have small money for mortgages because all that money's flowing around at the very top among a small number of players and yeah it's because they can hire as many lobbyists they can pay for whoever they want to get into government it's a real problem so do you have anything you'd like to tell us in general about, about your book, Main Street Smarts? It's, it's a great name. It sounds like it's going to be very good. Well, I wrote it actually because I felt like 
you know, before we had Occupy creating uh, space for a certain kind of political dialogue, that what was going on is we were talking to each other in the supermarket lines, all agreeing that what's going on is that where'd the money go? Where'd the jobs go? You know, why is it that the big companies seem to be able to do okay and we can't even keep a roof over our heads? We were all talking about that. But the pundits haven't been. And so I wrote the book mostly to show people what they already knew was true in the hopes that people would recognize it's very right. conversationally written. It's written from experiences that you'll read and go, oh, yeah, I've been through that, you know, because I felt like people needed to believe in our own wisdom, our smarts, because mm -hmm. we do know what's wrong. There wasn't one of us that thought that the market wasn't going to crash. We might not have known when it was going to happen, but you could feel it coming. And yet the economic uh, experts will still tell you to this day, Oh, we don't know how that happened. We don't know. We have no idea. <laughs> but they need to bet against it. <laughs> yeah, well, but they, but they claim, they still claim that it came out of nowhere. And for those of us who are looking at things in terms of the economic divide, you know, what has been the central message of the Occupy movement is the economic divide. We knew it was coming. You really can only have the wealthy have su have up to a certain percentage of the entire economic activity of our country before the rest of the economy just dies. It has to. There's not enough flowing around for the rest of us in terms of uh, financial opportunities and economic activity. It's just not. So it was given that it was going to crash. And that's what the book talks about. The first third is why did the market crash? And the last two thirds is that the policy solutions that we need for our lives to work already exist, but the political will isn't there at the top. And so that's why, you know, the Occupy folks have worked a lot with us on the foreclosure crisis in the different areas of the state and I think this is you know this is speaking to the most fundamental issue you can't have a decent economy you can't have decent jobs you can't have decent homes so long as the very top has too much of the economic um, power in the Bill society. McKibben mentioned when he was trying when he had the 360 events last year that uh, the last time the a big international organization got together uh, the United States didn't come up with any kind of support and he felt that it was very tied to the opposition of big oil and big business mm -hmm. and I wondered if you had uh, run into that yourself specifically uh, some things that well it's crazy the funny thing is when we look at the foreclosure crisis again that's where I spend my time these days but when you look at that the only opposition to the legislation that we want to pass the cities and towns want it small businesses want it, people want it. The only opposition are the banking associations and they come in and they say, oh, this is bad for us. Well, actually, if we could change the things we wanted, if we could stop the foreclosures, they lose so much value in a foreclosure that they make more money if we can pass what we can pass. So it's absolutely, you know, this organized opposition from a very small number of folks and it's hurting the rest of us. We can just get together and change it. Thank you it. so much for coming in, Grace. It was really <laughs> great to see you. And sure, thank to you. Hear what much. you had to say. Thank you. Thanks.